Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of Resistance TV. Uh, this evening we're going to be speaking about the scandal of food poverty, which afflicts uh, far too many people in the fifth biggest economy in the world. And there's been an abject failure, in my opinion, of uh, policymakers who have allowed this situation to develop. And of course, it's got considerably worse as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, to discuss this whole issue about food poverty this evening, we've got three uh, excellent guests, and I'm delighted to welcome back Ray uh, Wolford, who was with us last week. Uh, Ray runs the biggest independent food bank in the UK. Uh, we also have Charlotte Hughes with us this evening. Uh, Charlotte is a blogger and writes for The Morning Star, and she's also spent many years campaigning against universal credit and the benefit reforms. And our final guest is Candy Gregory. She's a former now, former Labour, now uh, independent councillor and a retired nurse and is a vegan campaigner and a good comrade of mine. But let me uh, start with uh, Ray, if I uh, can, Ray, because uh, you uh, are at very much the sharp end in terms of uh, seeing the impact of the COVID-19 crisis in relation to how it's affected the usage of uh, food banks and your own food bank in in particular. Uh, and I wondered if perhaps if you could just start us off really by uh, your take on what we're seeing in relation to food poverty and, and, and whether in your experience it's actually getting worse or staying the same. I mean, the statistics seem to indicate that it's got considerably worse as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, first of all, I really want to thank you guys for actually having this debate. It's a really, really important one. We've had, you know, talk about the climate crisis, the housing crisis, and nobody's actually talking about the food crisis, which is coming down the tracks. At the moment, as I speak to you, uh, Fair Share, which is one of the biggest uh, suppliers of food to food banks and outreach projects, is now merging with the Felix project, which is a similar type of operation, which will actually come cut down quite dramatically the number of food suppliers that feed food banks such as us, supplies with food for our network. The other two problems we have coming down the line, of course, is Brexit. We had today the government announced that up to 7,000 lorries could be waiting, you know, two days to get food into Britain. And we've also had the government say that we need to into shielding. People may not be aware that when the government announced shielding, people were sent a letter told to shield and then they were told they would get food parcels from the government and they would get a volunteer support. The reality was that after 13 weeks, the government alone confirmed that only 30,000 people got food parcels. They had 750,000 people, but as usual with the government, it was a complete mess up. And I still know people today who were shielding but never got any food. And we were taking calls from across the UK from people who were literally starving. And only two weeks ago, we, we heard of the story of, of, of a poor young woman who was found starved to death with her baby. And that is the reality that's happening at the moment. Food poverty is getting worse and worse. Those of us that work this sector are being frozen out by big organizations. They now call the food sector the third sector. It's becoming harder and harder to get access to uh, food at your local supermarket years ago, uh, your local community groups, Sally Army, uh, you know, the local cat protection league would, would have collection points. When you go to your supermarket today, it's all corporate. And what people don't seem to realize with the food crisis, if you want to operate as a food bank these days, not only is it increasingly costly with the insurance and the procedures you have to follow just to feed your fellow human beings, but also some of them now even charge you a franchise fee. I kid you not. And they call it a franchise fee for one thousand. £500 a year, you can open your own food bank. And so the, the, the issue for me is that what's happening is the people at the most in need, the most vulnerable, those that are too poor to have internet, those that are too poor to have uh, access to a smartphone. And of course, in COVID lockdown, there's no community centres, there's no advice centres, there's no libraries. How are these people going to eat? 
And with the food crisis we're having at the moment, people will be starving to death. And, and I've just done a freedom of information request last week, trying to actually get the figures to, for how many people have been discovered so far during this crisis who have starved to death. And that's quite scandal, scandalous in itself. And I just want to throw in a, a, another point. Every year for the past five years, I've been doing freedom of information requests into the number of people jailed and criminalized stealing to eat. Quite often, this is people going to the, the yards of, say, your local supermarket and taking out of the bins the, a food that has been thrown out and not wanted. On average, 13 to 14,000 people who have been hungry, have been stealing that food, have been prosecuted. They've been fined on average £150 per person. If they had £150, they wouldn't be stealing food. And on average, they've had a two-week jail sentence. How is that going to help people in poverty and people in hunger get into the work and employment status if they don't just have a problem with eating and feeding and housing themselves, if they've then got a criminal record that goes with it? And really, we need to be talking about the food crisis and how it affects all of us in a way that we're not. You know, it, it, many of us would be with our elderly relatives on a Sunday back in the day, and they would put tea on the table, and on Monday they would be at the food bank. Food hunger is something that our own families are too embarrassed to tell each other that they have. And we need to have a hope and discussion about how we access food, the rights of access to food, and to stop people in the fifth, sixth richest economy in the world from starving to death, which is becoming far too common in Tory Britain. Yes, and and of course we've we, we've heard that the government are planning to end the furlough scheme at the end of October, and uh, uh, various bodies have suggested that the uh, consequence of that will mean that we'll see a massive, an even bigger increase in the use of of food banks. And I think the Joseph Roundtree Foundation are predicting. Uh, nearly three quarters of a million additional people being plunged into poverty as a direct consequence of that decision. And then, of course, a bit further down the track, the, the plans to reduce uh, universal credit by £20 a week. Uh, I think that's due to come in in April. I mean, how are you sort of planning for that, uh, Ray, in, in the oh. next? a few months given that there's likely to be a big upsurge well the problem i have with my food bank is that i feed everybody so we don't get any state aid we don't get any council government funding uh, because we help refugees single moms lgbt the homeless people in temporary housing the disabled all the fundings focus so if you if you for example feed the disabled then you'll get funding for disabled but if you feed disabled people and refugees you can't get funding we feed nearly 5000 people a month across six boroughs because we're based in lewisham we can't get funding from lewisham because we feed five other boroughs we feed 140 families in Greenwich, but we can't get funding from Greenwich because we're based in Lewisham. And so what we're actually doing on the 1st of, of, of October, which is Black History Month, it's also part of the Global uh, Poverty Awareness Month globally, we're opening in London in Deptford the first ever food, COVID-aware food advice and solidarity hub which will open up as a food bank, food pantry, charity shop, advice and support for people that don't have internet. And the concept behind it is that we recycle food, etc. The community does it. And within just having 100 clients, the project is self-financing. So we don't have to rely on government funding, but the community, just by paying a small membership fee, can actually recycle, buy food, buy toiletries, and through the charity shop, pay the rent, which then has a model that we believe can work in Margate, in Glasgow, in Peru, in Madrid, um, into Ashton de Line. So we, we, what we're trialing on the 1st of October is the first community-based old-fashioned food hub and community base where it would be totally self-financing we hope would be the model that other communities around the country can copy because we can demonstrate that it costs almost nothing to set up but anybody can duplicate it so that that's what we're doing at the moment because the state and local councils are failing and those most at need 
cannot access the internet. And without access to the internet, many of the most vulnerable cannot get any grants. They can't even get universal credit because you need to have internet in order to apply. They can't go to the, the library or the, the advice center because they're all closed. And of course, we have evictions and all the other problems that people need support and help with. And there's also a lot of people that can't read and write. There's lots of people who are not uh, particularly uh, uh, internet savvy. And of course, with massive furlough scheme coming to an end, what people don't realize, a lot of food banks get food from cafes, from restaurants. At the end of the week, when they get food that they've overcooked or they've oversupplied, they give that food to the food banks. So the food banks are now, because of the closure of cafes and pret a and all these closures, has a, a very negative impact on us because it restricts what food we supply. And I, I, with the largest, because we open seven days a week to feed people in crisis. So that gives us the option to give people healthy food. And most of our clients might have dietary clients. We're the only food bank in the country that takes into account people's uh, dietary requirements, whether they're vegan, gluten, halal, uh, halal, sorry, or kosher, or gluten-free, lactose tolerant. Just because people are poor, you don't just give them a food pass and say, on your way. Not everybody has means to cook, and everybody will have some type of health reason that they can't eat certain types of food. So it's very, very complex field to be in, which is why I wrote Food Bank Britain, my book on, as guidance on the subject to help other groups around the world sort of establish these projects. But the reality is that we have to help ourselves. We have to, you know, take back our, our community centers, which are boarded up mainly around the UK, are being sold off for development. And we need to really claim the community spaces that every council has and turn them into community kitchens, support networks, so amend. Uh, even with COVID, there's lots of things we can be doing in smaller groups to help each other, whether we have rotors for community kitchens, whether we have rotors for you know uh, book sharing. There's lots of things we could be doing, but I think nobody's really talking enough about the shortage and the worry that far too many people have about putting food on the table every week i mean it's truly shocking what you said about the number of people being prosecuted because they're desperate and having to you know steal food to to survive i, I just wonder uh, what our policymakers have said if anything about that and just on your point about i mean obviously the people in your local area are incredibly lucky having you and, and the project that you run um, but it, it was really interesting what you were saying there about uh, the model that uh, could be rolled out in other parts of the of the country, and um, I mean, is there a is there an online way in which people could uh, access that information, or could they contact you directly, or could you give give uh, the resistance movement something that we can actually uh, you know promote uh, around the country to help other groups actually uh, establish their own uh, similar project to yours uh, that that you're running in Lewisham. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good idea. I mean, the comprehensive work that we do as well. I mean, the range of things. People don't have to do all the services we can do. They can do one side or another. The problem we have in London, of course, is that shop rents are so high. Even though everything is closing down, uh, the, the, the new base we have in Deptford um, has was a coffee shop that actually couldn't survive COVID. And so we've we've fortunate being able to use that as an opportunity but outside London shops and community centers are a lot cheaper to operate uh, and therefore the model you could run it you know even in your tower block with just 50 people so I, I will be sending out a, 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 a profile to everybody including yourselves this week with guidance and then with my email that people can get in touch with to get this movement my activism isn't about me doing something small in in Deptford my activism is about uh, empowering people and, and I'll give you another good example when we talk about activism uh, one of the things I campaigned for a very long time was against fuel poverty and we had this idea of saying why don't gov government and council buildings put solar panels on their roofs when the government had the buyback scheme and then sell the energy to the government. The government then gives the council income and that helps tackle fuel poverty and give people low cost fuel and the council said, oh, you can't do that. So at my food bank, we organized a public meeting and we got together unskilled local residents and we set up a cooperative. 
And we decided that if the council wouldn't put green energy and tackle fuel poverty, we would. So we uh, put, went through all the process. We got all the advice on, on, on setting up a community energy company and uh, got, went through all the structures. There's lots of help for online. And then we did our first share off and we raised £380,000 to put solar panels on local community centres, local churches, and local schools, which of course give them cheap energy. And the profit we made, we use today to tackle fuel poverty. And the investors who invested get 4% return, which is far better than you get from a bank or a building society. So it's a very sound economic model. A year later, we did the same, more schools, more community centers, and we raised over half a million in the second wave. And so my activism is really about saying, you know, the government is meant to be doing this thing. If you won't do it, I would do it. I would show you the way. If we can do it, the government and the state with the buildings and with the planning and with the finances could actually roll these models out. And it seems extraordinary to me that the councils who are really elected to serve the people are increasingly disenfranchising the very people who need them and their services the most. And these are very simple ideas like solar energy or giving over community centers to grassroots food projects who can transform the lives of thousands of people at no cost to the council. But of course, everybody's playing party politics and that's what gets in the way of the reality of what's going on. And just, just quickly want to say to about the crime figures. The first year I did the crime figures, freedom of information, the government gave me the figures for the entire country. It was 13,487 people jailed in the first year that I requested that information. The following year, the government was so alarmed about the press and the way I was taking this that they refused and said that it was too expensive to collect that data data and I would have to ask each region for that data separately. So just for the London region, I got in touch with the Metropolitan Police in London. And just for London last year, it was over 14,000. So we'd gone from 13,500 nationwide four years ago to last year, 14,000 alone in the London region being prosecuted, criminalized and going to jail. That's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. Uh, it's truly shocking. And, you know, I keep making this point that Britain is the fifth biggest economy in the world. To have anybody living in poverty, to have anybody being criminalized because they are in poverty, it's an absolute stain on, on Britain, frankly, and uh, an abject failure of our policymakers. And something I think that all of us and anybody, you know, viewing this program this evening and to, to take this message beyond. Uh, that to your friends and, and neighbours and so on, to encourage people to really take this matter up with your uh, members of uh, parliament to say, look, this is just unacceptable. This, this, this can't be right. And, you know, we need to do something about it. But what I think is particularly inspiring about what you're saying, Ray, is that where there's been a, a failure of policy makers, where there's been a failure of uh, representative democracy, that, you know, we can do it ourselves we need to do it ourselves and, and demonstrate that we, you know when we stand together when we work together you know there are solutions that we can we can we can deliver uh, and so it'd be really useful i think again as with last week you know when you came forward with some great ideas in the discussion we had then uh, if we could share some of that work that you've been doing some of those ideas that we can then help to share that uh, around the the country then that will be a, a hugely beneficial uh, effect i think of uh, the work that we're trying to do in, in, in commenting what, what you're doing. But let me bring in uh, Candy, if I might, there uh, now, please, um, because you are an elected uh, uh, member. You're a councillor on your local yeah. authority. And mm -hmm. uh, Ray, Ray was was quite critical, uh, as I am, in fact, actually, of the, the failings of, mm -hmm. uh, of local authorities and, uh, and certainly of, of, of central government. Um, what's the situation in your local area? I mean, how, are, how is your local authority rising to this challenge or aren't they? Uh, because there are lots of ideas that, that Ray put forward mm. there where, you know, an innovative local authority could actually make a bene real beneficial effect. It's just simply by, let, for example, giving local groups free access to some of the buildings that they uh, have in their estate. Well, we've been... Um throughout covid we've been feeding the shielded folk 
Uh, of course, that's all finished now. They're all escaped and um, that doesn't happen. But there was that money initially. There's a lack of community space for food banks. So um, the people that are setting them up and they, they are increasing in numbers, um, they are uh, scrabbling around for and they're using churchills and then the churchills want them back and they have to find somewhere else. And there's um, it's a great day when somebody does find somewhere permanent, but there is a shocking need. And um, the the use of food banks is has a real health impact. And, and what I was going to talk about tonight is the uh, food poverty and how it affects the poor. And because um, they are the ones that are suffering, and especially in COVID, we've got food poverty in the low income groups. Um, they don't have access to transport as, as the majority of, of better off people do. And like Ray was saying, they don't have cooking facilities, they don't have a fridge, you know, so they have to make their food choices with those things in mind. And we've got eight to nine million people in the UK who struggle to get enough to eat. And it's certainly struggling to get the right kind of food to meet nutritional um, need. The COVID is dragging more people into the equation with their employment issues and their lack of earnings. And they have to, uh, these this new group of people, they're having to limit themselves to their food choices. And the poorest are always the most disadvantaged and disenfranchised. And um, the, their households need to spend 30% of their disposable income to meet their dietary requirements. Whereas the wealthiest, just it's just 12% of their income and, and prices continue to rise. And again, the shelves are becoming emptied. Uh, and of course, uh, people are struggling like they've never struggled before and the numbers are rising. They just haven't got enough money to thrive. So there's a tendency for them to shop unhealthily. They go for the cheaper food. They go for the food with higher calories and the food with higher calories comes with sugars and fats. And so um, those food choices are very limited. But outwardly, um, somebody who is malnourished can um, seem quite healthy. Um, they can be really overweight, but that's because of their uh, access to food is, um, and especially I want to say about COVID, you know, we're talking about COVID and food poverty and your immune system is less efficient if you are malnourished. So any infection that you do pick up is gonna be more serious. Obesity is a, a key comorbidity in, in COVID. So a, an obese, obese patient who contracts, um, contracts it is 113% more likely to end up in hospital um, and 75% more likely to be admitted to ICU and 48% chance of death. So it's a real issue. Um, eating low qual quality food, high fat and sugar and salt <clears throat> leads to malnutrition just as e easily as not eating enough food does. And that's why obesity is such a sign of poverty. Um, and especially the children, you know, they're the, the poorest children are at more risk of obesity. And this is borne out by a real correlation between poverty and obesity that's happening now. And the, the parents quite often target these unhealthy foods with the high fat and high sugar because they know the kids won't reject that food. So it won't go to waste. And it also makes you feel fuller. So you're not so hungry. But there's societal problems with that. A malnourished child um, will be academically and behaviourally um, more at risk of problems and impaired development. And we know that there's children who are developing type 2 diabetes. And it's difficult to reverse that when you're living in this cycle of deprivation. Um, you are more likely to struggle. You, you live in poor accommodation. You won't have access. Um, your kids won't have access to a laptop or Internet. Your kids won't have as many GCSEs. So that affects their future prospects. And you're living hand to mouth. So your life expectancy when you're poor, when you 
don't have enough food is greatly reduced. And I live in Thanet, which is um, a poor part of um, Kent. It's quite a deprived area. Our area, compared to Tunbridge Wells in the leafier suburbs, life expectancy here is 18 years less than somebody in the leafy suburbs. So it, it just affects your life chances all over. Um, if you're, a, say, an obese child um, through food poverty, your lifetime chances, your careers, your health, your wealth prospects, um, and you're more likely to be bullied and stereotyped, and you're just treated differently in social situations. And this goes into your employment situations too. Whilst physical appearance um, can determine your career prospects. And we live in a society that values physical appearance. Overweight people often feel unattractive, um, poor self-image. And then they get into this cycle of eating cheap, unhealthy food just as they ate when they were kids, and it carries on. Um, so we've, we've, had a, we've had a point, uh, Candy, mm. from uh, from a viewer who's suggesting that because cooking isn't taught in the way in which it used to be in schools, that, that you know that that is an issue. Yeah. Maybe that's something that we need to be bringing back into schools, and maybe we also should be doing. And maybe this is something that local authorities could be doing: is is uh, giving people the you know the skill set to be able to you know use fresh fresh vegetables and and, and use the, mm -hmm. I, I, you know the point you made about some people haven't got access to cooking but where they have sometimes it if they haven't got the skill set to be able to mm -hmm. uh you know make a nutritious meal then surely there's a there's a a case for the the state for the local state the local authority to be mm -hmm. giving people the the support they need to be able to do that yeah. what, do you, what do you say to that yeah yeah, schools could be doing an awful lot, you know, and some schools are. And um, we're just thinking about growing food. Where does our food come from? And we can teach children to grow food and the, the, um, then what to do with it, cook it or prepare it. You, know, you don't have to cook everything. You can live quite well um, without cooking stuff. But um, yeah, there, there's a great there is a great need for education into what's healthy. And I remember, is it Marcus Ratchford? What's his name? Marcus Ratchford, the young footballer. Now he yeah. he's done a, a terrific service with um, lobbying and shaming the government into asking that every child gets a decent meal at lunchtime when they're in school. And how better way of um, making sure that a child has a future by giving them a decent meal and and it has to be a decent meal you know the um the, the school meals sometimes i think it's improved now but they used to just dish out a pizza and a and a, and a, a fatty pie there's got to be some quality with that to to ensure that children have got uh the nourishment they need that their body needs um to take them into a better future there's there's behavioral problems that really come with malnourishment and um and hunger and we are we're just um ignoring that to to a great extent um i was going to say about um just the the global issues of of um food poverty because we don't live in in a bubble as uh we we uh, we get food from um various points but a lot of a lot of what we what we grow um globally is used to feed animals and raising animals takes an enormous amount of land and some estimates say that it's 45 percent of the earth's total goes to feed animals and animal feeding is responsible for 91% of the anim, an, Amazon destruction. That's billions of acres. And we have to learn to feed ourselves differently. We can't keep using growth hormones and antibiotics in intensively farmed animals. We have to, um, uh, we, we have to think about the antibiotics becoming ineffective, which they are. And we're struggling to keep to treat people with bacterial infections and sepsis. And there's no new antibiotics um, on the horizon. It's just craziness that's got us into this local, local and global mess, producing food cheaply and unethically in um, in large numbers. So, and of course, it's the poorest that suffer. And we just need to to sort it out. 
we know the government won't do it. There's plenty of research um, to tell us that farming animals is, is a bad idea. We know that 50 billion animals are killed each year, and those 50 billion animals would have been raised by an expensive means. Um, dairy and um, meat industry has a knock-on effect of limiting food availability for others. If we all gave up meat and dairy, we could feed an additional 350 million people globally. And that's one way to reduce food poverty globally and easily. But at a local um, level, we have to think about the food banks because the, um, they can only dish out what they're given. And so locally um, in my community, we've been uh, growing um, fruit and veg and um, we've been taking the surplus to food banks. And I, I think probably Ray will know that that there's and I worked in a food bank um, during um, sh um, lockdown when people were shielding and um, there was although there was plenty of tins and there was plenty of these energy bars there was very little fruit and veg and I don't know if um, Ray will concur with that but people need fresh fruit and veg and one way of doing it is for the community to step up and use gardens, window boxes, um, allotments, to plant crops and to also, and of course the schools could as well, you know, we could go back to education, the schools could do this. And we have to bring children closer to nature and teach them where food comes from and that we don't have to live unethically. But of course, um, it's the, uh, the government's priority should be to feed its people and it's not doing that and it costs money to buy food. Um, and COVID has given um, Chancellor Sunak the opportunity to um, scrap inflation linked increases to welfare payments and public sector wage increase. I'm a nurse and nurse colleagues have been using food banks. So they, they're now in food poverty. Um, so that's my yes, sort of that's, that's a major challenge, no, no doubt about that, uh, Candy. Mm. And it's interesting, you, you, I mean, obviously, in your introduction, I pointed out that you're a, a vegan campaigner. And at the mm. end of the uh, 19th century, the Vegetarian Society was, was established, and they yeah. had a close working relationship with the labor movement at the time. And one of the things that they were doing was um, trying to give access to a, a you know, nutritious balance to mm. uh, meals for. Uh, the working class communities who were obviously struggling and uh, unable to uh, afford, uh, you know, meat products and so on. And uh, that was a, a really interesting um, uh, development at, at the time. And uh, we're sort of uh, gone full circle almost in many ways now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, uh, with some of the points that you're making about yeah. you know, the impact of the, the livestock industry and so on, and uh, and the need for good quality uh, food and balanced uh, uh, meals for for people is is something that uh, you know a, a vegetarian or a vegan diet could could certainly help with. But again, there's there's, there's it needs to be done to raise people's uh, consciousness and and awareness about that. Well, interesting, we've had one, one two comments about school meals. You, your point that you're making about school meals, Candy, mm -hmm. people are saying mm -hmm. that clearly the school meals are. Are still very poor quality. They've kind of yeah. after the, the Oliver intervention that you know they're, they're not really up mm -hmm. to standard. And so, while school meals are important, it's also the you know the standard of of school meals is is clearly mm -hmm. crucial too. But I wonder, I perhaps uh, need to move on now to to Charlotte uh, if mm -hmm. I can and just get Charlotte's uh, take on the uh, situation in relation to where we are with with food poverty and obviously your work that you've been doing at Charlotte in terms of campaigning about the benefit reforms and universal credit in particular, uh, you'll know from the work that you've been doing, uh, the, 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 the terrible consequences of the benefit reforms that, that, you know, that they've been having on, on people's ability to, to feed themselves uh, properly. And, uh, some of the difficulties that Candy was talking about are directly linked to the, the parsimonious uh, benefit system, in this country and again coming back to that point you know there is absolutely no justification for that when we are an incredibly wealthy nation what, what, yeah. what do you make of the situation that we're in at the moment charlotte and, and and what can we do what should we be doing to 
uh, put pressure on the, the government, uh, but also what can we do practically uh, in the absence of, of action being taken by the government? I need, for that matter, local authorities to step up to the challenge. Yeah, um, it's a disgrace that everyone is hungry now. It's not just a few people, it's not just a few thousand. People have been hungry for a long time now, since the first inception of universal credit and the benefit reforms with the SAMPIP. So we've got more and more and more people speak, uh, that are hungry and less access to food as well. Um, we've got a problem in my area and probably lots of other areas as well that the independent food banks are being priced out and they get nothing from the council as, well, as what they said. And the best are squeezed out. The council comes to them and says to them, right, we'll give you so much money if we can have an involvement with your food bank. And if they say no, then they go off and they get no help whatsoever, which is absolutely rotten. So certain organisations get certain amounts of money and grants and loans and food donations and everything. And that's disgusting because I found through the work that I do, the independent food banks actually provide more quality food and more often as well, and without the judgment that you get from some of the bigger organisations. And I think that's absolutely disgusting, you know. Um, I think it's absolutely disgusting that children are still hungry, you know, that we're still hungry, but children especially. Um, since COVID has happened, um, school, a lot of schools have cut the days, gave days down. So, like, my daughter goes into school for 10 to 9 now, and she finishes at half two. Um, now, a lot of children are only being given, including my daughter, 20 minutes for the dinner. That isn't even enough time to queue up for the dinner. So children are going without dinners. And also the schools, I know to my daughter's school is demanding that they can't hand cash in, you know, at the office and put money on the card. It's all got to be done now online. Where we've got the problem there is that the parents can't afford to put money online because they haven't got the cash online. They don't do online and they've got no internet at home. So we've got kids that are then going hungry. Um, we've got again, like the you know, you said it's it's a disgrace, and children should not be hungry. But also, we've got a lot of people now that are newly hungry, that are newly in poverty. So we've got those long termers going on, and then there's all the new ones, and they don't understand it. You know, a lot of them are hiding away; they don't know how to cope with this. You know, um, food banks don't exactly come knocking on your door. You know, unless it's raised lot, which they will do, but a lot of them don't, and you don't know they're going on, and when you do approach someone to find out, they're told bluntly, you can only have three food parcels and you're off. And that's still going on now. I had an email from an organisation that said, we're going back now to doing three food parcels and that's it. And I thought that was absolutely disgusting. You know, they get more donations and more financial help than others, but they're putting back theirs. I don't understand it at all. Hunger hasn't gone away. Uh, we're talking about people who have like what they and everyone says, they've got no access to the internet. They've got no credit on the mobile phone. They're not, they're not well enough to go out. We've got a lot of COVID pe people who have had COVID, uh, like myself, who are long, long term COVID sufferers, which means that people can't go out as they used to. They can't do what they used to. Um, even with long COVID, you, you struggle could sometimes cooking a meal or even going downstairs in the morning. You know, it's really, really hard. But people are hidden behind the walls. You know, long COVID has it been spoken about? People aren't talking about food poverty, like you said, and it's absolutely rotten. It should be the number one issue on everyone's list, shouldn't it? Um, it it's absolutely wrong. There's, there's a feeling of shame as well. I have had a, quite a few conversations with people who are now in poverty, but they weren't. You know, they had jobs and everything, and a lot of them were small businesses, and now the businesses are folded and they're reliant upon a system that can't support them. And they're saying, they're, they're phoning me up and saying, oh, Charlotte, I'm only getting this amount of money now. Is that right? You know, and I said, yeah, that's right. Well, how are we supposed to manage on it? And my answer was, well, we've had to manage on it for such a long time now. We'll help you to try to get through this. But we did tell you what it was like. You know, people don't weren't listening. It's a case of people don't think it's going to happen to them until it does happen to them, and it's hard to accept. Um, also, I'm absolutely devastated that the, the three boxes were, you know, the boxes that the local councils are hanging out and everything, they're ending. Well, they've ended. And but the food quality in some of them, it was absolutely disgusting. You know, it was all carbs and a few. I think you got one or two apples and one or two oranges or something like that. And that for someone who is already in Hill Health or with COVID is absolutely doing them no good at all. But the government weren't bothered about that. All they wanted is for this food to go out. They weren't bothered what was going in it either, which is absolutely disgusting. You know, um, we've got. 
But what do you think we should be doing then, uh, Charlotte? In terms, of, clearly, there's a massive problem yeah. there, and you know the quality uh, of of, uh, of you know the stuff that is being provided is is, is inadequate. Uh, we're seeing, uh, as I've already mentioned, the end of the furlough scheme at the end of October. We're seeing the benefit reforms and the cuts to social security. This is this is obviously creating a massive crisis, exacerbating an already huge crisis. Uh, what what would what would your advice be in terms of how do what do we do how do we challenge this I mean how, how can we uh, you know practically deal with these 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 really terrible uh, circumstances which are already hitting many people and are going to hit an even bigger number of people in, in the last few months of this year and into next year. One of the one of the solutions I think is to put more pressure on the supermarkets to donate the food, not the people who are already poor that already have, buy that food. They put it in the basket, and they're not having enough food to eat as well. It's it's absolutely disgusting that these big massive corporations cannot and will not give free food out like that. You know they won't put their own food in the baskets and hand them out. Um, and it's also not fair that. The independent food banks who work extremely hard are being left out of this, and they're the ones that do all the outreach work, um, and and that's terrible. One yeah, thing yeah. is to support the local independent food banks. Let's give them a push, you know. Let's tell the council stop funding your mates, you know. Stop funding these bigger organisations. What about the other one that fed like 150 people in the last three days? You know, they don't get any funding for that. Um, we need to talk to schools as well because it's unacceptable that children aren't giving, being given time to eat. And also, they can't pay for the meals if they can't pay online, you know, in a lot of schools. Um, it's absolutely terrible. The schools aren't addressing it, but they're in a bit of a situation here because they don't know what to do, you know. The teachers are getting ill. The children are getting ill. There's a lot of very ill children now. Um, you know, like there's already two year, the year groups of two lots of bubbles already gone out of my daughter's school in the, in the last week or so. It's just horrible. Um, it's it's absolutely pro it's absolutely terrible. I've spoken to people in the past and look what they says about people stealing to eat. It is a big problem, you know. And and you say to someone, well, I understand why you're doing it. You know, I do the same thing too. You know, if you're hungry, you're hungry. You know, and it's because they can't see any other way out because no one tells them. You know, if they're not got the internet, they don't know about it. They're not going out because they, they've got you know because of COVID and the high risk or they just don't want to go out and or they can't go out because the buses cost a lot of money don't they you know it's just it's just terrible we need to target them in some way you know we need to support the people that can do it groups like myself and like Ray's and that you know let's give them a bit of a foot up you know let's provide them with the means to help people on their estate you know in their area because that makes yeah. a big massive difference you know I mean the other way absolutely I fed like I mean yeah I Absolutely. I mean, and, you know, I remember years ago at school and so on reading about uh, in history, people, poor people being uh, penalized, being criminalized um, for stealing food. Uh, okay. I never thought, I mean, this was kind of Middle Ages, you know, and I never thought that when we got to the 21st century, that we'd be seeing uh, the very self same thing happening again. I mean, it, it truly is a scandal. And uh, we, we obviously do need to be bringing pressure to bear on our policymakers. And uh, we just had a, a, a question earlier this evening from Rona Topaz, who's, who's asking about the support from the uh, opposition, uh, Labour opposition in the House of Commons uh, to the government for its Coronavirus Act. And uh, Ren has been asking various MPs, uh, how long is this support going to continue? What, what's your uh, take on the bipartisan approach? Do you think it's appropriate or do you think that more could or should be done by the uh, opposition in the House of Commons to, to highlight some of the issues that you've been talking about this evening? Charlotte. I mean, I know they're working hard, but they do really need to step up a bit more and provide some opposition to this. Food poverty, food hunger, fuel poverty needs to be highlighted every single week at PMQs, you know. It needs to be spoken about. They need to be talking about it all the time. And at the moment, we're not hearing anything at the moment that is of any value to us, you know. it's it's Let's celebrate Christmas. Let's get our, you know, let's get the community celebrating Christmas. Well, I'm sorry, but the people I speak to have already cancelled Christmas because they know they can't afford it. They won't be having Christmas dinner and they won't be giving presents, you know. That isn't our priority. Our priority is feeding people, isn't it? You know, it's so keeping them in the homes and to feed them. 
And it's it's a no win situation if no one is supporting us and we've got to do it ourselves and it's really hard work, as Ray will tell you. You know, it's never ending. We need to put pressure on them. Like you said, we need to email them, you know, email our MPs, even if they're a Tory MP, we email them, you know, and because they've got to wear it as well. They can bin it, but it's a you know, that's up to them. Um, what- email them and but also i think uh, there's a case isn't there where, where, where mps operate uh, their own uh, sort of face-to-face advice surgeries yeah. to get to go and see them yeah and i know when i was an mp uh, clearly it was more impactful seeing a constituent face-to-face who'd got a, an issue because uh, you really got a handle on the the, uh, the the real implication for the person in front of you as it were much more so i think than than dealing with uh, with an email, I think emails and and your social media etc are important to try and yeah. put the pressure on. But if you know, get it, get delegate yeah. together and and go individually if 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 you can't oh, yeah. do that and and really you know put them behind the eight ball. Actually, you know, exactly. chase them down. I think is 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 in my opinion anyway. I think it will yeah. will certainly you know be useful. But let yeah. me just uh, go to Ray if I may, because I'm um, just interested in your um, thoughts, Ray, about the bipartisan approach that we're seeing. Uh, from the official opposition in, in the House. And, and what do you make of that? And when you finished giving a view on that, I've, I've had a question from uh, uh, Nat Sims asking uh, if there's any way of accessing funding online for some of the uh, work that you have been doing and and, and urging others to, to take on to sort of, I suppose, seed corn funding, seed corn funding perhaps to you know, help people get going. But what's your thoughts about the bipartisan approach that, that Keith Palmer seems I, so keen on at the moment? I, I think it's, it's quite scandalous. I think so the food hunger, to a certain extent, really links back to Brexit. You've got to remember that the the poorest areas feel very left and uh, left out and, and, and abandoned long ago, whether it's, you know, labor areas or Tory areas, you know, for some time. I mean, we all had hope when Jeremy Corbyn came along that he was going to transform uh, the country had the policies. And although um, my own mar- motion calling for a minister for poverty was passed at constituency Labour parties and at Blackpool Party conference, it isn't still Labour Party policy. And I think the problem is that all the political parties are so busy chasing the right that they're forgetting the left. And one of the interesting things I found out when I was knocking doors for Corbyn in 2017 was that the data we had was all old Labour. We'd stopped knocking on the doors of the people who had left because of Iraq. And therefore, on the night of the election, we all thought we'd lost badly. And then, of course, there was that letter from 172 MPs saying Labour uh, should not have Jeremy Corbyn as his leader. The MPs said he would be unfit not just to lead Labour, but the country. And when you've got core Labour Party uh, activists and voters told that type of uh, uh, spin uh, and negativity from their own MPs, you can understand how we lost that general election. I mean, the reality is the MPs failed us and we lost by 22, 23,000 votes the general election of 2017. We wouldn't have Boris now. And, and so it's, 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 it's a failure of political classes who, who don't understand poverty. To, to be fair, Angela Rayner has experienced poverty. There's a handful of them who know about poverty. But the problem is that once you get into the system of Westminster, whether it's you're seduced by the urban of the House of Lords, it still shocks me the numbers of, of hardcore socialists, including my own local former MP, Joan Ruddock, who was an equality minister, who is now a dame, how they're so easily bought. And I think the whole system of uh, political class is actually broken. I think the party system we have at the moment is failing those most at need. That's why we have Black Lives Matter. That's why we have the climate change movement. That's why we have uh, solidarity, not charity. The reason we have all these groups is because the political system is failing us. And we, and, and, and I, I'm you know trying to do that in my own way, are trying to find models which bypass the political elite, bypass, bypass the, the party system and actually allows us to deliver help and support to the communities ourselves and circulate our own money within our own communities. And going back to the, the, the issue your, your, your caller had earlier on on saying about access to money, groups like mine do not get money. 
you know, it, it, the, the focus of the money is on specific groups in the same way that uh, three million self-employed people couldn't access money or grants uh, when their lockdown hit. There was three million well-to-do coffee shop owners, you know, journalists, uh, theatre producers, all sorts of people you'd normally think were well off suddenly found they had to use the food bank because they could get no grants, no funding, no bank loans. So that was, you know, that dealt with that. With my food bank, we have tried and tried. I've spent hours trying to get funding. If it wasn't for my GoFundMe page and the sale of my books, which I use the funding from my book, Food Bank Britain and others, that funds my work, then uh, we wouldn't be able to do it. And, and Charlotte made a really important point about the quality of the food we give people. My food bank is the only one in the UK that actually targets food that is healthy. So we take into account not just the dietary uh, requirements, but also the health impact. Because even if you are rich, if people are poor and they eat rubbish, they end up going to the NHS and they overwhelm the NHS. We all pay for that. If we want a more efficient NHS, we need to make sure that the people at every level of society have access to healthy food. And we, we need to be talking more about being vegetarian, about vegan. That is a real alternative and there's real choices now. But the reality is that the money, and as Charlotte said earlier on, a lot of the money will go to local food banks, which are high corporate. Many of the food banks now pay their CEOs in six, in five, six figures. The money goes to the, the people at the top, and most of them are run by volunteers who work for free. But the people that run these organizations are earning a fortune at the moment. It's because become more corporate, which is freezing out food banks. Getting access to food and toiletries is harder. Many of these organizations that are household names don't give the food for free. They get it for free, but to cover their costs, they charge us a service charge. They charge us a monthly membership fee. How is that good and then they control our money and our food supply. So it's, you know, we need a, a, a bigger issue. We need to encourage when people donate, please, please, please donate to your independent food banks. There's a brilliant organization, the Independent Food Aid Network, which is national, that will give you the list of every food bank that's independent in the UK. And that's a good way to start. But don't give money and don't give uh, food to any of these corporations. And even the big stores, when you see those boxes in your supermarket, check who's collecting that food. And remember, these supermarkets are selling the food that ends up in those boxes. They're not giving you any food. They're not giving, they're profiteering from it. And nobody seems to think, oh, Tesco's or wherever, these are lovely people, they're giving food. They don't give food. They get their customers to buy the food from the stores, and then it goes into a bin, and then it's passed on. So a lot of these illusions of goodwill do not exist. And even the biggest food bank in the UK, we are told, is a certain one with two big initials at the beginning of it. The largest food bank operator in Britain is the Salvation Army. The second is the Independent Food Aid Networks. The third is the Trust the Trust. And yet whenever you hear the Labour politicians or the Tory politicians, the figures they quote are the 1.5 million food parcels that the Trussell Trust give out because they have a great marketing and PR department which drives their fundraising. The reality is when you add in all the food banks together, before COVID, it was 4.8 million people getting food aid, 4.8 million. In America, before COVID, it was 28 million American families were getting food stamps. That's greater than the entire population of Spain. And nobody is interested in food. Even those 12 million officially in poverty in Britain, a huge voter uh, uh, section of the community that could be mobilized to vote if somebody spoke in their language. No political party of any description has a minister responsible for the eradication of poverty. And that is a real scandal, not just in the UK, but globally, because poverty and food hunger is a global issue. And, and October is Global Poverty Awareness Month. We shouldn't need a month. We should be aware of it. 
every day we see people around us in our street corners, whether it's relatives that are going hungry or whether it's the news articles of the people starving to death in Britain in 2020. Very, very appropriate, though, Ray, that it's October because it's October when the furlough scheme is coming to uh, an end. Uh, and you sort of uh, anticipated a question, actually, that that uh, Mark Anderson had uh, put to us. He said he often contributes to uh, the uh, local in in the local supermarket that's collecting for for the homeless. And he's asking the question: Would it be better to hand the food directly to the person uh, or to the local uh, community centre? I think, from what you've said, it, it's cut out the middleman, as he put it. I think, from what you're saying, uh, if you can. Uh, go directly to to the individual indeed to the uh, independent uh, uh, food bank it's, from what you're saying that would be a be a better option than than the simply giving the food to, at the supermarket what, what would you yeah, agree I, with i mean i agree totally i mean people don't realize that the food they give is sold Yes, it, indeed. It's like everything, right. all these yeah. corporations. So they don't, they don't, they don't you know, we, we, we need to be clear on this. They don't technically sell the food. What yeah. they do is they sell you a franchise fee, which is the only way you can access the food, or they charge you a monthly membership fee, service fee, which then is hit because it's a service with premium rate VAT. So food banks are the only food organization in the UK which actually pays VAT on the food. It's completely outrageous. And just to point about uh, some of the bigger uh, um, uh, organizations, and uh, we did approach the Trust of Trust to see if they would uh, contribute to uh, this program, and uh, unfortunately, they wouldn't talk to us. But let me uh, just bring back in uh, Candy. We've only got about three three minutes left, and uh, we just had a question from from another uh, viewer who's saying, "What can we do in a practical sense to pressure local authorities and councils, regardless of party, to engage more with the food bank crisis?" Candy, what's your thoughts on that as a as a serving local council? I'll try and come to all three, and this will probably have to be the last question. What, in a practical sense, Candy, do you think? Uh, uh, can be done. Are you still with us, Candy? I think we've lost Candy. No, I'm still here. I'm ah, still yes. here. Well, yeah. Did you okay. get that question? Yeah, I did. Um, I think the, the issue is that councils themselves aren't getting the income because more and more people are relying on benefits and more and more people um, are applying for um council relief for their housing and, and um, council tax and so the councils themselves aren't getting the money so it's up to communities to address the shortages and of course as Ray just says you know there's there's they're really struggling um these independent we've got a few independent and they're doing great they're doing great but they haven't got fixed um accommodation they haven't got a base and they're struggling like raised people to get um, enough food and the right kind of food. And the longer that COVID goes on, the more people who are becoming unemployed and losing their incomes, the more we're going to have food poverty, the more we're going to have malnutrition and the worse it's going to be for people's prospects. You know, this thing can carry on for six months. I don't know if a, a vaccination's on the horizon. We keep hearing it might be. But I can't see um, a lot changing for some time yet. So we've all got to work as a community. We're not going to get help from the government. We know this government don't give a yeah. monkeys about about us. And as no, far as the opposition, absolutely. We yeah. Um, let, let me just take because we've only got a couple of minutes. Let me get just get Charlotte's take on that. I mean, th that was a question that Charlotte saying what what pr in a practical sense do you think can be done to pressure local authorities and councillors, regardless of party, to engage more with the food bank crisis? What what would you advise people who are watching this evening to do to bring pressure on local? We authorities? need to keep reminding them that there are independent food banks out there that are struggling. They're that busy supporting their own favourites, the ones that are in their good books, so to say, because they, 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 they're tied into them via money, financial and all sorts of different um, housing and all that sort of thing. We need to keep reminding them that we're in it, that there's an independent food bank there. They don't get any funding from anybody for this. They're, do, they're giving out just as many food parcels, if not more. You need to be helping them as well, but let's cut the ties off it. You shouldn't have to sign a contract with the local authority to say, right, we'll give you this money, we'll help you. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. Local, local, our local authorities should just say, 
we'll help you. So the local food banks, independent ones, and the people that use the independent food banks, and everyone else involved, we need to keep putting the pressure on them by saying, why haven't you ever donated to this one? Why haven't you been encouraging people to go to this other food bank? Why haven't you told them about this other food bank? Because they're there. They're not in their pockets, so to speak. And also making it aware that this does happen. You know, it's wrong and it does happen. And so many people are doing such amazing work out there, but the council doesn't tell people about it, you know, because they're not in their pockets. And that's an issue up and down the country, as Ray will tell you, you know. Um, yeah. What we could do is... is um raise as much awareness online promote the independent ones as much as possible which is what i've always done i am food out and i you know i know what it's like we've got something one day we have i mean the other week i am i fed four families you know on this on my estate that's all i could do but i fed four families quite easily i didn't get any help from the local authority for that they won't go near me you know and that's a sad sad reality of it you know and i'm sure a lot of that i mean i'm lucky it's probably my... a case then, Charlotte, for as as yeah. with MPs to pressure yeah. our local councillors, and in some ways yeah. should be a bit easier to pressure local councillors yeah. because they are much more in the community than the yeah. the parliament tend to be, uh, and yeah. many local councillors do operate their own advice surgeries too. So uh, yeah. again, people can go along and 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 press the. Uh, and just raise awareness. I mean, yeah. I think it's bringing pressure, but also raising awareness because sometimes councillors won't necessarily always be aware of the of the huge difficulties that people exactly. are facing and so it's really important to think that yeah. we that we bring pressure to bear wherever we can look we're out of time i'm afraid in fact we've gone over time can i just thank ray charlotte and candy for another uh, interesting uh, discussion this evening and uh, I, uh, hopefully there's been some really useful practical suggestions come through that uh, people who are watching this can take forward in their own local community and what we'll also try and do as we uh, as the resistant movement are building up our movement and we're setting up these regional hubs now uh we'll we'll pass on some of this uh, really uh, useful ideas that, that are coming out of these programs with a view to encouraging uh, people up and down the country to put in place some of the projects that we've heard about tonight uh, and to also uh, bring about pressure and uh, and organize uh, campaigns to to push our elected representatives in the local authorities and indeed in, in government, in, in parliament, to step up to the plate and be doing more. As I keep mentioning, you know, Britain is an incredibly wealthy country. It's the fifth biggest economy still in the world. There is absolutely no justification for anybody to be going hungry, for anybody to be homeless, for anybody to be living in, in poverty in Britain. And I think the challenge for all of us really is to demand of our representatives because we we are supposed to be living in a democracy a representative democracy our representatives need to be doing more to actually represent the people that are like them and that's really down to us i think to put pressure on them to ensure that they do do their job properly so thank you everyone for watching uh, resistor tv again this evening tune in next week at the same place same time seven o'clock thank you very much for watching this evening and good night